Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to 2024 and season two of Liquidware Chats. So to kick us off, we have none other than Steve Greenberg. Steve is the president of ThinkCline Computing, and he's also the founder of the EUC event, EUC Unplugged, which used to be the EUC Masters Retreat. So we kick off looking at Steve's background in EUC and how he got to where he is now. And then we look at, we delve into the world of EUC and what's going to be going on in 2024. We look at the platform vendors. We look at what's going on in the application space. We look at everything. We look at community and what's happened with community, given you know the news around CUGC that broke um, late in 2023. And then, as always, we finish with a look at the impact of AI on EUC. So really hope you enjoy the episode. Thanks very much. Steve, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fantastic, and welcome to 2024. This is a really interesting juncture, and I, I'm looking forward to this conversation quite a bit, James. Excellent. Yeah, me me too. Um, you know, there's obvious areas where, where, where we'll look at, but I, I, I think, you know, 2024 hopefully will be an exciting year. Obviously, 2023... Ah, it added up so much. Not so much. <laughs> not, not a great year to be a to be a tech vendor in 2023 or a tech reseller, I'd say either. So yeah, yeah, this is true. Um, so um, yeah, so so kicking off um, where we start off, you know, most people be aware of, of who you are, but um, maybe just give us a little bit of background about yourself. Okay, sure. So I'm Steve Greenberg. I'm based in Arizona, in the Scottsdale area. Um, been doing Citrix since about 1993 when I was the IT director at SunSource uh, products, and we needed to do some cross-platform stuff. And I spent a lot of time looking at all the things in the market, and I landed on this little company called Citrix that everybody thought was citrus, like the fruit, oh. you know, until you <laughs> clarified, no, it's an X. Um, and, and But the, the short version is I've been doing it ever since. Um, it just was the coolest technology. It allowed so many great things. And in 1997, I relocated here to Arizona and started this company, Think Client Computing, and, and have I just had an incredible journey. It was one of those right place, right time things where it was 1997. Um, I had the IT skills. I knew Citrix early on in the process and was able to jump in and just ride the wave. And I always feel a little funny when we call it EUC because our industry, our niche, our ecosystem has been called a lot of things. Uh, not all of them pleasant, <laughs> but um, <laughs> in, the, in the early days, the kind of the first name that became associated with it was thin client slash server based computing. And then you'd see variations of it. So my company was started at that time. So it was thin client computing. There's a little bit of a play on words like as a small business, you might start a company, you know, like Southwest computing, like, you know, some name describing who yeah. you are. So it was thin client computing. And it's just been fun for 20 many years to just watch the names and the people and the technology change and evolve. So I'm just an EUC nerd from the US. That's what it comes down to. That that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> and I think you're right. You know, we, we've had so many different terms, but the one that's kind of seems to have stuck is is end user computing, but server-based yeah. computing, which uh, you know, we still have thin clients. Um you know, yep. we've seen we've yep. seen changes in the thin client market just just this uh, late last year. We saw AWS decide to get into the thin client business. It's like I don't think okay. anyone could, could have predicted that one coming. And if they do, if they said they do, they're lying. As far as well, I'm here's concerned. the thing. So I said I started this company in 1997. Now think about what was going on then. There was this little startup called Amazon, which sold books. Now how <laughs> yeah, could exactly. you possibly? How could you possibly imagine where we are today? that that book company is making an enterprise thin client and all, and yeah. that makes most of their money from AWS cloud services, not from retail sales. What? <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. that, that's, that's something I've never heard before. I, oh, I, no, I'm, I'm... Yeah. So uh, in, in the industry, uh, one of my great friends, and I consider him a mentor, even though we're peers and friends is Kevin Goodman. And he's always analyzed. I know Kevin. Yeah, of course you do. You, you've always he's always analyzed companies from the point of view mm. of their public filings and and made me aware of many many facts and I've asked him to come to EUC unplugged which we'll get to and talk about this again but um, Amazon probably as a result of it reinvesting most of its money in the retail operation because you know expensive warehouses and infrastructure hasn't mm. historically been a money maker 
but they spun off AWS from their own internal systems, and it's a cash cow. It makes billions and billions of dollars every year, free and clear, no question. Wow. Okay. Um, Interesting I, fact, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as I said, like, you know, if you thought they would go into the thin client space, I I, I couldn't have predicted that one. It was just like, yep. it came it came pretty much out of nowhere. And, and yep. I think we're now all that's why I'm of, very hopeful about 2024 though, because you're gonna you're seeing a new era, right? So I would call the you, you know, you make things up the year of this year of that, but I would simplify it down to <laughs> I know yeah, where you're going for a second. <laughs> it's not the year of VDI. I'm not going there. It's what, never happening. Yeah, what, what Every year is the that, year of VDI. But it's exactly. you know, yeah. What I'm saying is that the the all the years to get to now in EUC have been the ramp up, the ability to deliver apps and desktops, protocols, security, um, management for deployment, provisioning, et cetera, like, and pro profiles and performance yeah. management, right? Now, linking to cloud, running workloads in the cloud. I think going forward, we're in a different phase. We're in like an optimization, monitoring management, user experience phase. Um, people have floated decks. I like the liquidware is going with post decks in terms of I think that's where we're at yeah right at this point. but you it's it's tools and processes that simplify and make a good user experience. We can deliver apps, we can deliver desktops. The heavy lifting's been done, but it's now how do you optimize it, make it part of a normal business flow? And who are the players? It's 2024. It's like, whoa, this game board has been all shuffled and crazy let let's get into that a, a little bit further let's let's start where it all starts the platform vendors and you know the the obvious two that we we have to talk about are citrix and vmware citrix obviously have gone through this massive acquisition um you, you know but there's still some turmoil going on we saw just before i think it was just a week ago that you know, over a thousand people were were let go of Citrix when we thought that was all done and dusted, and then out of nowhere. Um, and you know, I I think it's it's that coupled with what's going on with VMware, I think has made um, it's kind of created a a, a pause with what customers are doing in the market because they're kind of yes. like, you know, people are going well what's going on here is is this is is this company i can bet my future on and then obviously that just plays right in the ha into the hands of microsoft because they're stable they're doing you know slowly creeping along making avd uh, avd better and better and then you've got windows 365 so it's like it you know for years yes everything ran on microsoft but it was citrix or vmware on top and now it's like we're seeing that shift towards um, Microsoft and it, it's kind of like, how, how do we get past this turmoil? Yeah. And yeah. what, what does the next, what does the, the next phase look like? And will we see a resurgent Citrix or are they, you know, are they in decline? Now that's been said several times about them and, you know, Citrix is dead, blah, blah, blah. And they've always come back, but are we getting to the stage where I, I don't know. It, it's interesting to see what's going on. I, I still think there's a lot yeah. to come from them, but um, there is a lot of flux. Well, boy, this is a big subject. Um, Isn't it? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fork it into two conversations and keep me on track here, okay? Yep. One is not where I expected to go, but I want to bring it up. There, there's, there's kind of like an emotional, and then there's an intellectual or a business side. Let's talk mm. about the emotional for a second, because we're both um, community group leaders, right? I started the Phoenix Citrix user group years ago. I have this conference, EUC Unplugged. You have a vibrant group in your hometown, and it yep. met as recently as November, right? So yep. there's this element of community. Us EUC nerds love this stuff. We've built a career and a life around it and our friends and our community. But that Absolutely. part is really, really tough um, because we, we make a personal investment. And um, some of these programs have kind of, you know, they ebb and flow, they come and go. Citrix's was just abruptly ended because the CEO of Cloud Software Group decided we don't need that. That's painful to people. So emotionally, you know, we have a history and I just want to acknowledge that and also thank everybody. 
Um, when, when that corporate decision came down, what really didn't occur was a proper thank you to the community. I'll say hundreds, you know, dozens of leaders at any given time running groups, hundreds of members and maybe thousands of people actively involved, even if it's just attending or posting or using the forums. So thank you, world of EUC. It, it deserves a great deck recognition that it did not get um, from uh, we're talking about Citrix, but other vendors as well, things have come and gone. So on that level, I just think we have an incredible worldwide community and we should just recognize that. So that's the emotional side. Boom. <laughs> Intellectually, you know, I hate this phrase, but it's what comes to mind is it's just business. Things change, um, it, especially live, working in technology and having been like a reseller integrator for many years, 26 years. Everything you can imagine has changed, right? The book company is now a thin client vendor running large data center, multi-billion dollar profit data center. So you just have to navigate. But the, the thing you have to understand now is the speed of change is so fast. The way I describe it is we used to sit on a product for a few years and learn it and optimize it. As an integrator, I would install it many times at different clients, learn the best practices. We even could have a document Here's our best way to do this. We'd always modify it. But today, it's almost like every time I look at a situation, I have to start over. The technology, the vendor chain, this has been acquired. It doesn't work that way. They dropped this feature. Um, the new firmware has a different behavior. And it's okay. You have to embrace it. If you can embrace that in a kind of a beginner's mind or I won't have all the answers mo mode, You'll be fine. You have to navigate. And I am actually answering exactly what you said in terms of no, Microsoft I... Citrix, right? What, yep. do you, what do you choose? You've just got to choose the best tool. And, and you also have to navigate cost and price because when these companies like VMware and Citrix change, it becomes real difficult to navigate. They change to a mode of charge the full price. And as an experienced reseller, I'm seeing Citrix customers get insane quotes for like renewals or upgrades. And with my experience, I'm able to go in and get it back down to where they used to be. So that's a little hint I want to drop out there. Negotiate those things because I'm hearing people say, oh, my God, Citrix just sent me this bill. Who are they? They're crazy. Let's drop them. It can be it can be changed. So yeah, I'm just for, it's, keep me in yeah, mind. No, I, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, no, I, I get where you're going with that. You know, yes, you know, we've seen these massive pr pricing increases, but as you said, it, you, you know, that's where your 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 value add partners come, where you know they negotiate yeah. directly yeah. with Citrix yeah. or the distributor and and figure those things out. And cost is definitely a factor. But then if we if you know, and and I, I understand what you're saying about the emotional side as well, because while we, we use the term EUC, there's a lot of us who've come from a Citrix background, myself yeah, included. Right. Um, exactly. And, exactly. you know, we, we've developed from there, but the core, like, you know, the core thing I started learning on was like, uh, I think the first certification I have is like presentation server three. So, okay. it, you know, it, it goes back and then I've kind of grown that as the years and uh, and similar to yourself, but I'm sure it's like win frame something. <laughs> win view actually, even before. Win, win view. Frame. Yeah. Even, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, as I said, there's that emotional thing. Um, yeah it it's and then i suppose the, the the one to look at is is the other one is, is vmware who the other big player with you know have been head to head with citrix for years um very um you know in terms of technologies similar stacks can deliver you know there there's they they you know they've had the market share between them for for quite a while and microsoft has slowly been building that up but there you know, in you know this... I'll interject if, if you if you remember yep. the kind of advice that you probably said this many times or heard it many times, but as an IT person, people come to you and say, What kind of laptop should I buy or what kind of desktop? And 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 like the 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 common sense answer we've all sort of developed is buy what you need now because yeah. you don't know what the next model is going to be, you don't know when the price drop is, you don't know what's coming next. And believe it or not, I think that's the advice for this confusion that you're describing. VMware, Citrix, there's a history. These are leading products. Do I use them? I think you just have to kind of push all the noise out and look factually. That's why I said intellectually, it's just business. What do yeah. I do? 
I'm, I'm, I'm a customer that's used Citrix my whole life. I don't know what's going on. I had a big renewal bill. Do your best with the renewal bill. Stay with it. See what happens, right? I'm a, I'm a Horizon View customer. I don't know what the heck's happening. There's a rumor they're going to sell off the EUC division. Well, you can't stop running your business, right? No. So what's in front of you now? And if, like, if something happened bad, you just have to accept that that was out of your control. I know it sounds sort of pat or almost like self-help information, but you can't control all these factors. No, you 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 really can't. And as I said, you just need to do what's best for your business. And um, right. obviously with a lot of businesses, there's a dependency for uh, maybe a particular application, be it some, if it's in healthcare or something like Epic or something like that, whereas, you know, you need... Exactly. Exactly. So, so it depends on on the requirements of the business. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I suppose we've dealt with the platform. <laughs> you know, kind we of. Can, we, we, we kind Let me of. say one more thing. Let me say one more thing. Um, yeah, absolutely. I've been tied to the Citrix camp, so I I haven't deployed much VMware Horizon View, although tons of VMware hypervisor, right? Yeah. Um, on Citrix, you you have an interesting situation because. The people in charge of Citrix, like Sridhar is the general manager and Chris Fleck and a num number of people are still there from the old days. And mm -hmm. they're doing a great job with the product. There's not, they're actually doing a better job with the product and features and updates, reliability, focus than ever before. But that's part of the confusion. The business headlines make you nervous, but I actually see great things happening on the product and, and an investment in engineering. So abs abs absolutely. And right. then, you know, things like, you know, bringing back terms that, w you know, we, well, most exactly. of us never dropped, like I never right. called an net scaler in ADC in my right. entire life. Never and stopped. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it, yeah. Exactly. So, so, and the fact that that's, you know, that they've got a very defined message when it comes to net scaler, CVAD, there seems to be lots of development going on there. Um, so yeah, no, there's, there's, there's lots going on that um, is, is, I suppose, that they're uh, it's it's taking engineering you know engineering is happening and innovation is happening so right, so exactly. um despite the noise from that others might be making there is actually innovation going on at citrix so um and and by the way if i can just riff on liquidware so liquidware is a great example of something that has bounced along the ocean of changes right we're finding liquidware really useful right now um, we thought, you know, the profile wars were solved with FS Logic, <laughs> and they weren't. That was great, and then it became, it went through all of its own things, and um, we're we're just finishing a project that Liquidware has really made an incredible difference with, which is a hospital that came from old school kind of one-off provisioning, like they had many, many images. It's a Citrix shop, many, many images, dozens and dozens. And um, with the stack of Liquidware with FlexApp and Profile Unity, we've been able to rope that in. So this entire enterprise is running off a single image. That's that's that that's really like, good. That is amazing. Right? No, it is. It is. And and that is the power of FlexApp. I suppose what I would say is, you know, to, to get the, the plug, you know, we've been there through it all uh you know exactly. all, of this, all of this flux with the euc we're still here uh um, yep, we're still yep, yep. doing what we do we're, we're innovating you know we've released command control just in august yep. there's a new release of stratosphere coming obviously profile unity and flex app continue to be developed there's you know flex app one because of things now if we talk about you know if we want to hone in um one of the things is obviously app v to msix and and what's been going on there and you know <laughs> we we know we know app v end of life has been called on app v and we've heard numerous times that microsoft are not going back on that so so there is kind of a, again this um thing where where i suppose you know you can absolutely deploy some stuff with um msix because it there are certain apps which it, it suits yep. And then, you know, as a companion solution, you can then introduce FlexApp. So, you know, we, and and then you have the certainty because obviously with FlexApp, you can pretty much, um, you, you can create a FlexApp out of nearly any application. Right. You know, our, right. our SMEs, our, 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 
I have Jack on our Slack community actually put a, a, a challenge out there. Send him any application. He guarantees he can flex app it. So, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I have a couple. I'll be, I might submit a few. That Set, stuff yeah, send them to Jack Smith. <laughs> uh, just go on our our, yeah. our, 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 our yeah. Slack community at, at Jack Smith, and and then he 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 put the challenge out there. So um, it's up well, to him. We're, since we're in plug mode for Liquidware, but this is all totally sincere. Um, it it really has enabled things. I think this last couple of years has been a perfect window for FlexApp um, because of the uncertainty and the changing in the platforms, and we've just really. We've gotten the results. The thing that, in addition to this, is the nerdy headline of we got this complicated hospital system down to one yep. image. Um, but um, the other interesting thing is we were able to break the dependency on managing the image because they have a lot of apps that change rapidly, like once a week, once every two weeks, right? Okay. So now we have a monthly patching cycle, you know, patch yeah. Tuesday sort of thing for the image. But yeah. those apps that keep changing are done independently. And that's a concept I wanted to share to the community is abstracting the app from the image, which we did for years with App V, but without good support. And, you know, we couldn't kind of keep making that our tool. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. No, and, and that's a use case we see for Flex app all the time is that, you know, breaking that dependency between the image and having to crack up the image every time you want to go do the applications or you had like 20 different images and then have to manage them. Uh, exactly. So simplifying that whole kind of image management and, and you know, we, we do challenge mo most customers. We will say we should be able to get this down to like, you know, you mentioned one, you know, on a maybe on a bigger That's enterprise yeah. yeah exactly we can that's because i have down. joe shank that's because i have joe shank on my team Absolutely. <laughs> for human abilities <laughs> yeah well exactly it, it, it's about the 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 tools and the people that you utilize as well so um you know that that's um and, and we i have to say we have some some great people on the liveware team especially you know in in development around flex app and stuff like that you know there's so much exciting stuff some of it I would love to talk about, but I, you know, well, I can't. Well, yeah. Okay. Good. Well, <laughs> this, when the time is watch, right. Watch this space when it comes to Flex App, because there is okay. lots going to happen in 2024 with Flex App. It's a it's a really exciting time for Flex App. So, um, yeah. So moving back to kind of uh, the general view, I suppose. Um, what do you see as being you know, some of the big trends that you're seeing for 2024. Um, is there anything that jumps out without mentioning the two letter word? We can talk, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to be completely honest is I feel good about 2024. I think the economic direction and the uncertainty with key platform players and the mm -hmm. commitment of Amazon and others to large scale, you know, to Microsoft and Amazon, to large scale EUC as a thing, as as a, you know, in their world, billion plus business is what matters, you know, and they see it that way. And it is that way. I'm, yeah. I'm very optimistic, but I actually don't really know or have a strong sense of where it's going. Um, but I have an optimism because I see it. I see it moving forward and being funded and supported after a bunch of turmoil. So it's a really kind of a lame answer, but what I'll what I'll put out there is we do have EUC unplugged in April, where we the worldwide community comes together, and I'm really looking at that as a nexus of um, getting a temperature on where we're at and and some other viewpoints on where is this all going and where to align. But what I always do is I align with the customer because I'm I'm an integrator, I'm a consultant, absolutely do, you know, complicated systems. I align with the customer. What is their need? Um, I never put my preferences over that. So, but I don't have a good prediction. I just I feel positive. I know Is it's it... going to be more of a of a service orientation and mm. more of um it should be simpler in a way. Um but I don't know. I I'd love to hear what you think. Oh, uh, well, I suppose uh, you know, the one of the big things I think is um you know, with with EUC we try and make it as simple for the end user, but there is so much complexity going on in the background. Exactly. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I think, I think that's where we need the simplification it is yeah. that, you know, whereas, um, Oh God, I'm going to have to mention it. <laughs> you know, uh, and I, um, but 
I suppose one of the big things is obviously automation. That is that is the thing yes, where yeah. where it brings yeah. the most benefit is if you can automate these kind of simpler yes. processes um, for for be it you know desktop deployment, image management, all of these kind of things where that kind of helps the admin yes. side of things. Yeah. I suppose from a from a customer side of things, and and you've probably seen it yourself, like. Dex is becoming, you know, front and center. It's it's becoming a metric for companies yes. that yes. they, yep. you know, end users don't expect don't accept what we, you know, in the past we would have put out lockdown Citrix desktop. Here's your published yep. applications. You can do what we say right. you do. You know, the the generations have moved on. It, it it's not that's not acceptable. And I suppose. They actually have a voice now as well because we obviously deploy things like user sentiment surveys. So I, I think Dex is going to become more and more. And I suppose when it comes to Dex, and one of the things is, you know, how do we define Dex? Um, and are we being led by by different people about what is Dex? Whereas, um. You know, or a DEX solution must have this particular component. But I think okay, that... let me, let me interject on. because um, we have a, a a a a very current experience that's pointing to exactly what you're saying. I'm going to go back before DEX. We had this situation where we can monitor the environment. All the lights are green, plenty of RAM, CPU, but there's still experience problems. Right? That's kind of a traditional thing. Then yep. we have Dex. Let's measure the user experience. And that's been wonderful. We we do this. This is our methodology. We have like monthly and weekly meetings with customers. We're reviewing Dex reports and metrics. Um, and that's fantastic. I love it. That's the era we're in of user experience and, and management and ease and process. Um, but we just had an experience where all of our monitoring tools and our Dex our tools are coming out great and this the customer did a survey with the users and uncovered a lot of negative sentiment so i said earlier emotion intellect yeah Dex getting into the world of perception now it's, and uh, and this is a whole other thing which yeah yeah which, which has been a part of my practice because when i do projects and i've i've done these at major conferences i've explained this methodology it's called the end user agent it's a mm -hmm. way to go into a business and find out what the heck's going on and what the users really experience. That is still not, Dex is still not there, but that's the human bridge. Yeah. And is it the case in some cases where if you're, say, deploying user sentiment surveys, do end users go perceive that there is a problem when there isn't actually a problem <laughs> because that's the human element of us. Yeah. Well, yeah. is there a problem? I might actually experience a problem um, right. when it's just, so it, it alters their perception. <laughs> so, so, so This is really funny. I'm, I'm laughing so much because one of the big transformative um, projects I did years ago was at Mayo Clinic when we first had the ability to virtualize and do Citrix as we think of mm -hmm. it at scale. And um, we did it. And the greatest moment of that project um, was when it was over. The The project manager was a fantastic guy who had been a trauma nurse before going into IT. So he's very familiar with the people. He he, yeah. he knew everybody, like, you know, from multiple careers. And mm -hmm. we, we did one last walk, you know, we sort of like hand off the document, every, everything's done. We did one last meeting where we walked to the hospital to the different pods where these new the thing clients were being used and tried mm -hmm. to interview users and talk to them and get their feedback. And the greatest compliment was that they were annoyed with us because we were interrupting their job and they didn't care. They didn't see and they don't, they don't know. In other words, they didn't know we had changed everything from broke ass local processing to yeah. centralized awesomeness. And the greatest compliment was not noticing if that Absolutely. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I get that because I, you know, I've I've seen it before in the past. Like a, a user would say they're they're using their local PC, and then they go to Citrix, and they're like, "Oh no, it's 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 slower than my old machine or or something." So yes, right. the absolute greatest 
compliment it is they didn't even notice right. so and now, that's what we want that, well you know when 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 someone says well I, it's slow i have a bad experience okay well how are you accessing are you at home on your wi-fi are you at starbucks there's lots of questions and and i went to that just to say that the tools are great the focus on Dex is wonderful that we it's a term and it's tools and we use it, but there is still a human element and, and you do have to talk to people and, and really also sometimes just go witness their experience. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose that that is is harder if you're, say, you know, looking at an enterprise environment globally distributed, right, right. then you have to utilize that that. But as you said, that that you do need that kind of human element and you know that's where i suppose the 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 user sentiment surveys do become useful because you kind of get that that insight and yeah. i suppose it, it's all about how you phrase things um if you just said was you you know if you keep it very general you're not going to get much information but if you kind right. of probe right. the user and ask for more specifics then you can kind of uh, delve into it so i suppose yeah, yeah. I, I i i think you know the the term i've used is you know and it's been called end user computing, but the, the user is actually important now. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, when everyone gets really frustrated when we have outages or big problems or everyone's losing, you know, losing their mind in the middle of things, I always say this all would be awesome if we didn't have end users. What's the point if no one's using it? <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah, exactly. And it, it kind of, so, so just going back a little bit, um, we talked about community and um, one of the things you mentioned is obviously you run a uh, community event called um, EUC Unplugged. That's I right. think it used to be called the Master's Retreat, if I'm remembering correctly. That's right. It used to be the EUC Master's Retreat and not for any real strong reason. We just wanted to sort of rebrand it, refresh it. And we went with the EUC Unplugged. And then afterwards, we realized that Liquidware had Liquidware Unplugged. So I called Jason Smith and asked him if it was okay. And he said it was so we didn't steal it but it's the same flavor of let's get rid of let's get rid of, rid of pretense and formality and we're going to unplug and just get together and really put our minds together on on stuff that matters yeah and speaking of liquidware unplugged we have one happening next week and um, next thursday with none other than uh, sean bass so wonderful uh, wonderful yeah so so getting into why did you um you know, given uh, why did you form um, EUC Masters now EUC Unplugged? What was so, the what was the did you see a gap in in, well, this, in the, the, this is a really interesting story because it's going to thread together everything we talked about. So what really happened was I started the Phoenix um, Metro User Group for CUGC. Yeah, and um, I I had come out of other more like programmy iot sort of like super geeky or other groups that were held locally phoenix is a very good tech community and they had different format they already kind of mastered the um sort of open space approach like so if you go to like an iot developer meeting it would start with okay what's everybody working on and does anybody want to talk about something there wasn't like a top-down management a guy would go oh i'm writing this code let me show it to you or i created this thing so um I started that um, with the opportunity to do CUGC, but I felt a little bit at odds with headquarters because I wanted it to be user driven. I didn't want it to be like sponsor driven, like tonight is all about Nutanix or whatever. And so we, we kind of pushed back a little bit and we formed a great group that started to grow rapidly. And it really came from, we're having these awesome meetings and one person, I always say it's Barry's fault, Barry Flickinger, who works at Drive Time now, great Citrix admin, said, why don't we do a bigger event, like a weekend retreat? And I'm always the guy that's like, great idea, let's do it. And it started as part of the user group. But the weaving into what you were asking about earlier is as companies started to cluster or support community or not, or sponsor or not sponsor, it became pretty clear to me that um, we needed to be independent. We needed to service our users and keep that independence, which is kind of how I started the CUGC. So um, it, it really evolved out of an organic desire, like people wanted more content, more contact. And it was just a local thing. And then I would tell my friends in the industry about it, and like, I'll come. And then people started coming from Europe. 
and I'm like, okay, we got to, you know, this is, this is serious. So it, it grew organically, but it was based on two things. One is the independence of truly being um, the user. And then by the user, I mean like the attendee, um, what matters to them. And after 20 plus years of doing conferences, which I've loved, I, I, you know, I loved all the conferences, the synergies, the bribe forums, everything. And I spoke at them for years and years and years and kind of mastered from my personal goals, the ability to do that. But they weren't what I would want to do. If I was going to go to a conference, it would be chill. I would have plenty of time to talk to people because I'd go to these conferences. I'd be like, oh, my God, there's Sean, Sean Bass. Hey, Sean, I got to talk to you about this. Like, oh, really? You're working on that? Great, great, great. Oh, I have to go give a presentation or, you know, the, the CTP meeting. You just never had that time to like chill out with somebody. You tried. And, and so I wanted to create an event that was basically a, the whole event was the ability to just do what you wanted. <laughs> and, and so, pursue so am I right in saying there's no agenda? There, Technically, there is no agenda. It's highly structured. All your mm -hmm. meals and keynotes and the things you have to show up for are structured. And yeah. then the spaces are there. But everything between is formed at kickoff of the conference with, with the people. Wow. Who attend. And it uses That's... open space meeting technology formed by Owen Harrison, who was a meeting planner and found that the best parts of every con he was in the industry of planning events and the best parts of every conference were the break time that's when people reported getting the most done so it's it's a conference of break time <laughs> interesting that's 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 really interesting i suppose um i i am you know given where i am geographically i i've never had the, the opportunity to to go but um hopefully sometime in the future um We'd love to have you yeah, no, I, I, I'd I, really like to. Um, but I suppose, um, and I, I really like the concept, uh, I suppose the, the, the only other event which kind of has that kind of casual laid back style for, would be E2E. Um, right, right. And E2E um, is fantastic, and, 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 and Alex does a fantastic job. He actually knows what he's doing. I, I don't have any idea what I'm doing. And that 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 that's part of why it's fun and it's charm and it works. Um, but each yeah. of these program. So it's not random in that I'm talking to everybody all the time anyway. We're talking about pressing subjects. We invite people who will speak. There are planned spots because it's not random, but we leave a lot of time for it to self-organize based on what's happening. So one example would be, I did, I did a lot of conference presentations over the years. And as they became more formal, they would ask you for your PowerPoint months in advance. And then you'd show up at the conference and the CEO renamed all the products that morning, for example, right? And you spent all this time preparing, right? So we don't need to do that. Our peers have been in the industry a long time. They're mature. They they give presentations. That we I do architectures and designs every day, so we don't have to be bogged down with like the PowerPoint. We can just go. What are you working on? And people will say, I'm really struggling with um, app layering right now. Okay, let's get a session of everybody who's an interested, has input, has questions, and organize them. We also make the setup so that if you're in room A and the app virtualization layering discussions going on we don't book room a afterwards so a session can go as long as it needs to and that's that's the difference and it happens all the time good okay. sessions will go for two or three hours and we're not interrupting them because that's what you're there for you're important yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? that's a really cool concept i have to say because yeah. you know you do feel sometimes you're constrained to whatever you know and the time period you're given and and that's the way that you know a lot of events run so to have that kind of freedom because i suppose one of the things for me going to something like e2e it is the times outside of the sessions where i get yeah. the most benefit i remember having a, a really deep conversation with eugene from control up uh standing outside yeah. It, yeah. having a few beers um we were talking so what'd about what did you guys talk about? Just I want to take an example. It doesn't matter what general topic. Oh, we were talking about AI. 
you know, okay. we were talking. So, yeah. so here's what would happen is we'll be at an EUC conference. This actually happened last time. Um, and people and, and, and you're free to say. What the F is AI? What, how does it even matter? And then there's people there who work in AI. They're EUC guys, but they, you know, they have a background in, you know, programming or science. Yeah. Right? yeah. And um, and 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 we had an AI session last time because we had a guy there who you know works in AI and knows about it. And, and otherwise, it, it it never would have come up. It wouldn't have been on my agenda. I wouldn't have known yeah. to put it there. Yeah. And, and um, the other one that's really fun is we invite spouses and non-tech speakers and people to kind of interact to, to broaden the horizon and one of okay the now that's 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 interesting because um, yeah. take take me for example my wife is a historian she 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 works in academia so you know that would be completely different uh well hold sphere. on a second though let me tell you stories though that you, and, and i know i might bug you until you come with her so <laughs> had some of the best sessions come from these people and because a couple of years ago, um, a non-tech person I brought in was my sister, Patricia Greenberg, who's a wonderful author on fitness, health, diet, mm. and and increasingly I'm focused on how to age well and, and be happy as you age. And um, she came and she understood. She's my sister. She knows kind of the vibe. She understood the open space circle. And she said, I'm non-technical, but I don't understand what's all this about hacking and security. And then can we do something on hacking so I understand it? What should I do? And Patrick Coble's sitting there and he has the ultimate session on, you know, privacy protection. And, and yeah. it started this interest. So one of the most popular sessions was created by my sister, right? That's cool. <laughs> um, no, that's, 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 that, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing. But yeah. But, but the other times it's happened is <laughs> uh, Rick Millard, who's our, our artist sign badge guy. He creates our medias and he's an incredible dude. And he's very integral to the event, brought his girlfriend and she was just listening. And she also was not a shy person. And she joined the circle and said, you know, I've just developed a stress management program for corporate people that I'm going to be delivering, you know, in the workplace the rest of this year. Would anyone be interested? bazillion hands go up we gave her an hour she went for two and a half hours and i still get people today this day saying to me thank you so much for that session it, it really changed my career wow I made that up no so now it's my wife to come and say is anyone interested in the historical implications <laughs> <laughs> you know and you'd be surprised yeah no no uh no absolutely and uh yeah that that, that is very different because um she has been to E2E in the past, but just there for the social aspects because she was saying, like, yeah. you go off with your nerds. Um, I'm going yeah, looking right, around right. Barcelona or wherever E2E happens to be because obviously it's usually in some really nice city. So, um, yeah, that is a very different that they're actually part of the the, the conference. Um, so I applaud you for having such a unique conference within our kind of world. And, um, yeah, I will <laughs> definitely see what we can do in the future. We need to get you out. That absolutely. Um, right. So, um, to kind of finish up. One of the questions I ask every guest is, you know, and it's the elephant in the room. It's like, what do you think? What's your view of what the impact of AI is going to be in end user computing? And you know, that can be anything from anything you just yeah whatever your view is in general about that topic or you know some people sigh about it but i personally am of the opinion i am very excited by it but i'm absolutely petrified by it as well i did a presentation at e2e my first slide was uh the the t1000 <laughs> on screen and, <laughs> and the skynet logo uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and then someone said to me afterwards you should have did war games i'm sorry t Skynet stood out for me more than war games. So yeah. Like... yeah, that's that. I, I agree that 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 actually Terminator is the perfect uh, example. Exactly. Yeah, um, it's uh, I'm thinking of Dickens. It was the best of times and the worst of times. It's a reflection yeah. of humanity. The answer is, is what will humans do? Right. Mm. And unfortunately, we don't have a good track record on that. But the first part I'll, I'll say is every major technology um, 
threatens to disrupt jobs and productivity. And uh, none of them have actually done it. It's possible AI will be the first, but the mm. steam engine did not ruin the economy. It revolutionized it. Uh, electrical power distribution did not get rid of handmade services. It, it created all kinds of new services. So I think in that same regard, people are people. They have the same needs they need. We can envision the future like we couldn't ever in the past with other innovations. So I'm hopeful that, you know, humanity will continue and not be wiped out and there still will be jobs and wonderful things for people to do to be productive there is definitely some really scary implications if you apply evil to ai um yeah. things you can do I, I would say the first thing that really jumps in my mind is like deep fakes and also um extended um brainwashing ai, mm -hmm. AI could do a, a very patient campaign <laughs> to instill ideas in people that could be very dangerous for society so mm -hmm. malficient uses of ai i think are very frightening um but it's it's not different than any other tool or weapon so we have to be careful there on the positive i think it's the first time that um we're going to have star trek like capabilities so i'll give an example um that i thought of the other night my wife is a wonderful artist and likes to try different medias and one of the things she was doing was um, developing graphics for sets of cards, different kinds of cards. I think in this case, they might have been tarot cards, but she was doing different ones. Mm -hmm. And she was using AI, but she's an artist. She's a, a master artist. So she's using AI to assist her and to choose things. And she's going to make these a print-on-demand product, right? So I create the graphics, I assemble it, I partner with a company, and someone can see it and then place an order. And I and it occurred to me that what AI could now do in the future would be, so when you search for something, let's say like artistic tarot cards, or she may have had some other, I'm sure it was some other more meaningful style. Um, uh -huh, you, of course. you would find her shop where you can buy them, right? Here's the difference. AI in the future, you could search for artistic tarot cards and it could say, what would you like it to be? And it could design it, render it, mm. ship it to you. Yeah. All, all in one task. Now, yeah. in that regard, you've taken out every human <laughs> except who works at Google. But you have described something you've wanted, and now the system will replicate it. That's why I said Star Trek, Star Trek replicator. You ask the computer for something. Yeah, the AI could create what you want and have it printed and ship it to you. So that that's just an example of where I think it's going. Yeah, and 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 one of the the examples um I looked at, and you know, if you apply it to our world, say AI is monitoring a server, um, it, you know, it's got multiple users on it, and there's a performance issue. Left, if you just let the AI go oh. at it and optimize that machine what's the first thing it's going to do it's going to start kicking users off so mm -hmm. i still think like yourself there has to be a human interaction required so ai can examine analyze and say make suggestions yeah, yeah and yeah. then go back to someone and we approve disapprove whatever but you know left now obviously as it gets more intelligent, that will change and it will understand user behavior. But I think at this early stage of where we're at, that's the kind of thing where I see it having an impact in our industry or things like, you know, what as we talked about the whole automation, you could automate the deployment of, say, spin me up 500 desktops in this Azure region with these applications and away it goes. And you know, you don't have that manual process anymore. It just does it all for you. And then it's all monitored and, and rem can be remediated. But as I said, you know, there's some sort of human interaction to say, maybe kick off that process or end it or, or that. And I think I see it personally at the moment as an aid and, um, you know, to help us with those. I think it can be really helpful in some of those really complex problems and, you know, I, I listened to this uh, podcast the other day. It was um, Bill Gates and Sam Altman, and they were talking about, you know, 
they were talking about the human element. And, and one of the things Sam Altman said was, you know, there's always going to be problems for humans to work on. So just they might be the complexity level might be next level, but we then have the AI to aid us in those issues. So it might be at that stage, you know, which galaxy are we going to next? Because and that kind of thing. So so um and and in fairness to those guys, they're they're just as worried about the fact that potentially they, you know, AI could, you know, wipe us all out. Um and they they do want safeguards put in place around this going forward. And no, actually, least, yeah. the thing is the thing is at least in in America um it's the best and the worst we don't really do well with safeguards um and unfortunately because mm. of the insistence on the openness you get all this pushback but i think there there do need to be safeguards that's clear that has to happen yeah and i i think in in fairness uh, you know as you said Americans don't like safeguards, but um, Biden issued a presidential order around AI and, and um, you know, already. Yeah. And he was he was one of the first ones to implement legislation. And obviously, EU, a lot more bureaucracy involved, but they are working on stuff as well. So, so yeah, I, th I think we do need to do it because I, I think if you said, you know, let the AI do whatever it's going to do, that that's 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 the scary scenario where we don't want. But for me at the moment, um, it, it's very much a, a, a tool to help me in, in what I'm doing and, and you know, it, increased efficiency and that kind of thing. And as you said, you know, none of the no, no other technical revolution has, you know, put, a, put us out. Um, you know, it, it, there's always been obviously there'll be impact. You know, if if we get into scenarios, say we're talking about driverless cars, then obviously people who drive uh, cabs or or taxis or whatever you call them in the world, uh, you know, th there's a potential impact there. But you know, if, if I'm talking about AI and driverless cars, I've seen some videos, and I wouldn't want AI controlling my car, uh, you know, because right, so, it sets out so, to. Let me, let, me give wisdom, let me give some wisdom from years of experience. I'm now sixty, so I'm getting to be the older guy. Um, Every important technology actually takes significantly longer to mature than everyone believes. So the the you see, I'm sitting in my music studio. I'm a composer and a musician. And yep. in the 1980s, uh, Philips and Sony developed the CD, you know, compact disc for audio, yep. um, 16 bit audio, 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate. Um, that was considered on paper to be the perfect rep reproduction of music. Solved. Right. It's only now <laughs> in the 2020s and maybe the 2010s where digital audio has become a satisfactory user experience. The human perceives it and says, yeah, that's it. It's there. It took decades for just audio to get to be what on yeah. paper was perfect to be really enjoyable and there and good. Yeah, so I, I still have now? over 600 <laughs> CDs. So, yeah, exactly. Um, so, these things take a lot longer. Self driving is a perfect modern example. Elon Musk saying next year, next year, next year. They're not even close. Yeah. And, and I think, and, and to go back to that podcast, I was listening, Sam Altman was even saying he, he, th he thinks that, you know, we've had this massive or this perceived massive leap. And the next level, he thinks, is actually going to take longer than people perceive. Exactly. Yeah, We're not right. going to see this yeah. instant. You know, we've got to the level. There's still efficiencies that can be done with the likes of GBT four and or uh, or four five. You know, it, it, it'll be incremental. The, the the giant leap came kind of, I suppose, when we all became aware of ChatGPT and then everything else that's happened since then and yeah. Microsoft Copilot and that, but. As you said, I think it's going to take time before we get to the, you know, the the really, in some ways, the really scary stuff. I I, I think we do yeah. have some time on our side. Now, you know, there's, you know, lots of people who said potentially it could be the 2040s, 2050s, and some have said it could be the 2030s. There, there, there's, there's a perception, I think, in the Indians, nobody actually knows when the right. next kind of phase, and they don't. Um, fully, you know, they're building these models, but they don't know how quickly they're going to develop and that kind of thing. So, so I think, yeah, I, I see it as a, a companion solution to what we're we're all doing, and it getting to aid us. Um, as you said, you know, 
if it can do good, it can do bad as well. And, yes. and you outline some of the cases. It, that's how it's implemented, right? Exactly, exactly. But that's that could be anything in our sphere, you know. If it, there's good uses and there's malicious uses, so um, yeah, it's it's a kind of a balancing act, isn't it? But um, as you said, I, it, it's it's kind of exciting to see where it's going, but at the same time, it's it's a bit scary as well. So it's, it's, it's kind of a bit like a roller coaster because. You know, you've got that anticipation and then you got, oh, my God, I'm so scared. <laughs> so, <laughs> Absolutely. But, yeah, but I suppose that's 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 just where we are. But um, this has been a really good talk. Um, I've really into- enjoyed the time, um, Steve. I think um, we're in exciting times, um, both in EUC and in the world at large. Um, I think as a concept... EUC unplugged is a really cool thing, and um, I I think you're gonna have some real success with it. Um, and I know I've heard stories. I've I've talked to the likes of Doug Brown and that you know Doug raves about you and the conference quite a lot. So and I know he'll be there. <laughs> good. And, good, he gets um, it. Yeah, yeah, he does. And and it's great that we have events. I think like that, like um E two E um E two E V C. You know because we we have had this kind of flux and you know it's, it's going to be interesting to see if we look at um if we go back to look at the community obviously you know we've seen in the uk they are now an euc general group the Nor- norwegians have done it as well um right. yep uh, uh you know other countries are obviously going to to look at it as well because because at the end of the day we all like you know we all like meeting up uh, and, and then sharing right, ideas. Yeah, that, yeah we, <laughs> it's all about the community at the end of yeah. the day. So, uh, and right. we have to have some medium. And like, this is great that, you know, we're utilizing tech, uh, technology. You're in the US, I'm in Ireland, and we're able right. to talk. That's fantastic. But would it be so much better to be in the same place, having a beer and having a conversation? Right. Absolutely. And we need my personal goal is to get you and your wife out because now I'm intrigued with um, what kind of history session she could do at EUC <laughs> Unplugged. <laughs> she, she's a modern Irish historian. Um, so, oh, so wow. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, that's that's her focus. And she's actually at the moment she's working on an EU project all around identity. So, and how that affects um things like um immigration and that you know and you, you know if you're an immigrant in a country and having that physical identity you know be it a green card a passport all of that kind of thing so she's she's very much involved in That's that kind of thing yeah um, yeah no it is yeah. so she She's actually going to where is she no, that's a different project. She, she's going all over the place. She was in Geneva last week um doing meetings around that. So well, you know, Steve, one thing if I can add just the, the, yes. about I know we're, we're time wise, we're closing up, but the EUC community is very unique. It's really a group of people that's worldwide that have this common bond. And it and it, it's very, very real and it's pretty impressive and amazing. That like Doug Brown talks about, he can go anywhere. So he hasn't been to Asia yet, but anywhere he goes, he knows somebody from EUC. Even if he doesn't know them personally, he knows their name or something they've done together. And yeah. it, it's it's an incredible bond. And that's why it is emotional when companies come and go, because it it it, it is um a community of people and a real community. So I just wanted to say that again and thank that community and recognize it. And thanks Liquidware for supporting it. Liquidware's oh. Liquidware's been consistent, I have to say, in doing this. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I um, you know, personally, I, I only joined Liquidware just a year ago, but yes, uh, absolutely. There's definitely perception, and and it's not just perception that they do. We do support the community in in the, any way we can. Um, and as you said, it, it is a kind of when it comes to community, it is very much a motive and. As you said, we are, I think we are unique. And I've had similar occurrences where I've just been in a city for a night and I'll just put a message out on Twitter and say, anyone want to grab a beer, grab dinner? You know, I'm in whatever city it is for, for tonight and tomorrow night. And generally there'll be someone there who I could meet up. Or if I, I've even yeah. had people do it, you know, say they're in Dublin. I've said, okay, do you want to go meet up for a while? So yeah, I think it is unique and it's something I'm, I'm, like yourself, I'm passionate about, so I, I want to, to it to keep going. And um, 
you know, I, I'll put out as much as uh, I can and that. So, so yeah, I, I, I really, I think it's a, an essential part of, of EUC is the community side. And it's something yeah. I, I, I hope continues to go from strength to strength. So to conclude, thank you so much, Steve. This has been oh, really good. You. I've really enjoyed this. Um, I hope everyone enjoys it when they get to listen to it. It should be out in the next week or so. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, James. This has really been a pleasure. And anybody who's interested, just go to eucunplugged.com. It'll take you right to the event. It's a small event. We cap it at 100. So just get on there and register and come on out. And I'm going to be bugging you, James. I want you, I want you there. If you can't do it this year, I'll bug you for next year. All right. Thanks very much, Steve. Take Thank care. You. Take care.